to be here. So I want to do a number of things uh, over the course of uh, our time together. So the first is just tell you a very personal story, uh, a little bit about myself, uh, really the narrative from kind of cradle to standing in front of each and every one of you here today. The second one uh, is a little bit about this organization, uh, Pencils of Promise, that I founded around seven years ago uh, on the side of my job and the journey that we've taken in taking a very non-traditional approach to a very traditional industry and how it's led to success and scale. And then the third is really the most important part. Uh, what I want to do ultimately is share some of the lessons learned, and in particular, the lessons that can lead to a life of both success and significance, because I fundamentally believe that each and every single one of us has the opportunity to achieve both. Um, so I think it's difficult to understand where you're going unless you know where you come from. And so whenever I tell my story, I always like to start with my family. My dad is the child of two Holocaust survivors. Uh, both his, grand, uh, his parents, my grandparents, were taken out of their homes at a very young age, uh, initially sent into a ghetto. From the ghetto, my grandmother's story in particular led into a cattle car. Uh, she entered that cattle car with 25 other family members and her 12-year-old sister. She was 14 at the time, and her mother. And they were sent out in this cattle car to Auschwitz. And when they arrived in Auschwitz, the other 27 family members were sent to the left, and she was sent to the right. And all of them were killed that very first night. And she survived through a series of absolute miracles for over a year in a number of concentration camps. And my grandfather has a very similar story as well. And so growing up as a kid, since they lived in the town next to me, I'd always ask them these stories. You know, tell me about what happened to you when you were a kid. And I knew very, very intensely the story of their survival. And so when I was 13, I ended up opening uh, an E-Trade account. And when I was 16, I started working at a hedge fund. And when I was 19, I was helping launch a fund of funds. And I was on this very exciting fast track to a Wall Street career. Uh, it was living the dream in my mind. Uh, I couldn't have imagined anything better. And I ended up going to Brown University. I was a, a basketball player, so I'm playing college ball at Brown, and I'm studying economics, and I'm landing all the right internships, and I'm on the right path. But the truth is, the path that I was on was driven by one thing and one thing only, and it was acquisition of as much money as I could get, because I knew that some of my teammates from my teams lived in the projects, and I saw what their homes looked like, and I saw what some of the other people that I knew grew up in, and they lived in these big mansions. And I thought, well, the happiness must be in the big mansions. So the more money I can make, the happier I'll be and the better I'll be uh, with my life. And so uh, as a sophomore, I found myself uh, sitting in a dorm room, excited for my summer of internships, and I realized a, a very simple idea that I would share with you all now. And it's this idea that true self-discovery begins where your comfort zone ends. So Dan Pink has one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. And in that talk, uh, what Dan Pink refers to is what actually motivates us as individuals and motivates our employees as well. And it turns out it's pretty surprising when you break down the science. He refers to three things that motivate individuals. The first is autonomy, the ability to dictate our own path. The second is mastery. But the third is what he calls purpose. And Today, I'll refer to as meaning. It's this idea that we crave connection to a broader whole, uh, that we want to be a part of something more than ourselves, and that ultimately, what will really endure in each and every one of our lives is the legacy of what we leave behind. And so I started to think about this concept, that true self-discovery begins where your comfort zone ends. And I decided to go as far as I could outside of my comfort zone to figure out who I wanted to be in my life. And so I learned about a program called Semester at Sea. For those that aren't familiar, Semester at Sea is a cruise ship. Uh, it has almost 1,000 people on it. It's a floating campus. And you go literally around the world. You stop in about 10 different countries. And in each of those countries, you have about four to six days to get out, travel independently, and then get back on the ship. And there's college professors that are teaching throughout the voyage. And I had a series of absolutely life-changing experiences while I was on that ship. Uh, one of them was that I would ask one child in each country that I went through a very simple question. And the question was, if you could have anything in the world, what would you want most? Anything in the world, what would you want? And I'd have them write it down on a piece of paper. And when I got to India, where the poverty was just the most devastating that I'd ever seen in my life, I, I couldn't imagine poverty like that, in particular affecting children, uh, I asked this one boy who's a street beggar, and I said, if you could have anything, uh, absolutely anything in the world, this kid who had nothing, what would you want most? And he didn't give me the answer that I thought, which was going to be 
you know, a, a, a massive house or the coolest technology or video games or owning a sports team. This, this young boy, this street beggar, looked at me and said, if he could have anything in the world, he would want a pencil. And that was it. And I happen to have a pencil with me, and so I gave this young boy this pencil, and he just lit up. I mean, elation. And I realized that he had never been to school before. Not for a day in his life, and any time that somebody gave him something on the street, it was immediately taken away by most likely a gang lord, maybe a family member that put him out there, an older kid. But the pencil was this symbol in his mind, as he saw other kids going back and forth from school, that it would unlock his sense of personal creativity, of imagination, and most importantly, of opportunity, that it could be a tool of self-discovery. But what I'd really encourage you to think about is what are the tools that will unlock your sense of personal discovery and creativity and ultimately opportunity, and how can you provide that to others? And so I ended up coming back to New York uh, in my early 20s, and I went through a series of job interviews, and I ended up uh, with this great job offer uh, working at Bain & Company, uh, consulting to a Fortune 500 company, seeing how the inside of great businesses work. And I was learning a tremendous amount. You know, on the level of mastery of acquisition of knowledge, my learnings were going through the roof. But uh, I wasn't spending a lot of time outside of my personal comfort zone. And I found myself at the age of 23 completely immersed in a life that was revolving around two things. It was my work life and my social life. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that, right? It's just work life and social life and work life and social life. And I thought, how could I connect this to a broader sense of purpose? And so if you can, I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes right now, but just in the back of your mind, right, picture that one person who in your life has done the most so that you could be in your position today. The person who has sacrificed more than anybody else. If you can just picture that person's face, just nod your head. Okay, we all have that person. Maybe it's a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, a coach, a mentor. So in my world, uh, it was Ma, my grandmother that I was telling you about. And in late 2008, Ma was turning 80. And Ma lives in the mecca of Jewish grandmothers in Boca Raton, Florida, okay? And there is intense competition there amongst the grandmothers for greatest pride uh, in their grandchildren. And I thought, you know, I could get her a new set of golf clubs, I could get her, you know, a, a gift certificate to a great restaurant, but what could be the most transformational thing that I could not only do for her, but for our relationship? Because my grandfathers have all passed away. And fortunately, my grandmothers are alive. So how could I honor Ma on her 80th in the most profound way? And as this woman who was taken out of school, never able to return because of what happened to her during the Holocaust, what if I could find a way to build a school and dedicate it to Ma? Wouldn't be, that be the most powerful thing that I could do? And so fortunately, Bain at that point in time had an externship program. They let me leave for uh, about six to nine months to pursue the creation of this organization, which I named Pencils of Promise, inspired by that young boy. And uh, I found myself, at that point in time, 24 turning 25. And I think, you know, many of us believe that big, big transformational ideas, they always start on a stage with bright lights, with a tremendous amount of power and influence and money behind those ideas. And we feel helpless if we are not in that position. And we think, well, you know, I'm not in the position to put a million bucks into a business. How can I ever have an impact? How will this dream ever get off the ground? But what I would challenge you all on is another idea, which is that big dreams actually start with small, unreasonable acts. And so this was mine. I went to my local bank, uh, October 1st, 2008. You can see this is the actual founding deposit slip for Pencils of Promise. And I said, uh, I want to start a new organization. Uh, what does it take? And the woman at the bank said, well, you have to start with at least $25 to open up a new bank account. I said, that's a great sign. I'm turning 25 this month. So uh, you can see, $25 deposit. By show of hands, how many people here have access to $25? Okay, so I really believe every person has this revolution beating within their chest. And it's our job to identify it and then live it fully, uh, no matter how small you start. So uh, my birthday was that month. I said, I'm turning 25, great, I'll put 25 bucks in a bank account. I'll ask for donations in lieu of gifts. And everyone said, this is not possible. You're talking late 2008, the pit of the economy in New York City at that point in time. And everyone said, this is the worst possible period in which you could pursue something philanthropic. Uh, again, where I would challenge that idea is that it's when there is chaos, it's when things are fracturing that you have the greatest opportunities to pursue ideas that others will deem impossible. And so we organized another event and another event, and pretty soon uh, we ended up kind of preempting or helping to create what now everyone refers to as crowdsourcing. 
And so in contributions of $100 or less, primarily from young people, uh, we were able to raise a little bit more than $25,000. And with that $25,000, I knew I could go out to a country of extreme poverty in the developing world and find a way to build at least one school. And so I found myself uh, leaving Bain, leaving New York, getting on a flight, backpacking a motorbike, and figuring it out on the ground in rural Laos. And I turn around one day, and these three beautiful little girls are just kind of peering over my shoulder. And I decided to turn around and shoot a video, which I'll show you all now. And you're hearing me say Jia Sun Young, which means what's your name, and then Nim Dae, uh, which means smile. Jia Sun Young. Nit? Nim Dae, Nim Dae. He Jia Sun Young? Tamun. Tamun. Jia Sun Young? Nit. Nit. And so you'll see a primary school, but the bricks were the very first school that we were building, which is a preschool. And you're going to be our first preschool students. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good? <laughs> All right, I think you guys like it. So, so when I met, met Nit and Nut and Timon, everything changed. Because suddenly, it was no longer about a personal project. It wasn't about trying to you know, further my relationship with my grandmother and honor her. It was actually about the commitment made to these three young girls. And I think most modern marketing ideas would tell you, never put that piece of content up because it's not high production value. You, know, you have to get a quality crew out there. You have to shoot a beautiful piece of content. But another idea that I would share with you all is this notion that you cannot fake authenticity. There is so much value. You cannot fake authenticity. And this was an authentic moment. And I felt a real responsibility to share this with the individuals who had made contributions as little as $20. So I went online. I put this up on Facebook. I tagged every person that had made a contribution. I said, this is who you're impacting. And I went to sleep. And I woke up the next day, uh, and my inbox was just flooded with all of these individuals that had seen and shared this video saying, I want to be a part of this. And uh, what I realized was my job was essentially to create a high-impact organization that operated with the world's best business principles above all else, the greatest business principles that go into the best-run organizations, and convince people that there was a better way to do effective philanthropy, and that that better way to do effective philanthropy could not only impact the lives of these children on the other side of the world, but that it could create a transformational experience for you and your family and connect you to that idea of the business of meaning. You can be in the business of creating meaning for yourself, for your employees, for your consumers, and for your family. And so uh, it's been about just over five years since I left my job full time to do this. Uh, there have been so many people who have taken the same ride with a loved one, with a family member, uh, rallied around this organization. And I'm proud to say, uh, in the five plus years, as of today, we just recently broke ground on our 300 plus school. Uh, we have more than 30,000 students in our programs. Part of, I think, leadership is uh, the recognition that listening intensely is a far more valuable skill than speaking immensely. Okay? Listening intensely is a far, far more valuable skill than speaking immensely. And over the last five or six years, I've gone on this journey of just simply listening to great leaders, taking their advice and trying to incorporate it into this organization or any other business endeavor. And uh, I realized that there wasn't a book out there that was necessarily capturing many of these lessons uh, or disseminating them, in particular, amongst employees of mission-driven companies or those that sought to realign with their mission or on college campuses. And I think that the way that we consume media nowadays is very different. Uh, I think we binge, right? So how many of you watched a full season of a show in a weekend? OK. I can see the, the shame and the joy on all of your faces right now. Uh, but I wanted to write a book that was framed around 30 very short chapters that you could binge read. You could open it up on one end of a flight and finish it by the time you got down, uh, landed on the other side, but also episodic. So you could just pick up the 12th chapter and gain a, a valuable insight from that chapter independently. And so I wrote this book, The Promise of a Pencil, that uh, came out and has now uh, been used by JP Morgan with every single one of their employees. And, high net worth clients, or as the all freshmen read at Arizona State University. And I think the reason that it has had, the journey that it's had, is not because necessarily the title, 
but the subtitle, which is how an ordinary person can create extraordinary change. And so each of the, the chapters of this book is, is framed around uh, 30 short mantras. And I just want to share with you all five quickly today. So I believe these are the five keys to transform ordinary into extraordinary. And so the first one uh, comes from my mother. So my father's favorite word is ambition. My mother's favorite word is integrity. And it was something that was drilled into us as children over and over and over again, that integrity is much like character. It's most demonstrated when no one is looking. And as business leaders, the higher you climb, the less oversight you have. And the more that your responsibility will become to uphold integrity with every single action. And it's also one of those unique things where you can act with integrity, make the right decision 99.9% .9 of the time for 25 years, and one bad act can crumble that entire house that you've built. And so I'd really encourage you to value this idea of integrity and recognize that integrity is the currency that buys trust amongst those who you interact with both personally and professionally. The second idea is that you should do the small things that make others feel big. I think oftentimes as we ascend to positions of power and authority within our companies, we forget what it feels like to be at the junior level and how incredibly important it was for us to get that occasional sense of recognition. I mean, I think back to my college basketball playing days where I was a bench warmer for a D1 team, but throughout the entire practice, I was watching the coach, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you're always watching the coach. And when that coach looks at you and says, hey, great job, appreciate that hustle play, or you as a, a business leader do that one small thing to recognize that junior person, it goes so, so far. So the, the third idea I think is best demonstrated through this incredible video that I just found uh, on Facebook. It's about 45 seconds. I'll, I'll play the video and then share the insight. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds ugh, and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. How powerful is that? Right? A one millimeter domino within 29 steps could topple the Empire State Building. And I think each of us, we have these big ideas, but there's this sense of paralysis that we feel because we're picturing the Empire State Building. We're saying, how am I one day going to build this business or this P&L that I'm going to oversee or this organization that is going to affect millions of dollars or millions of lives? But what we forget is that it always starts with the one millimeter domino. And so I would encourage you to capture and act on your one millimeter domino moment, whatever that moment is. And once you have that, in my case it was as little as $25, uh, you have to speak the language of the person you seek to become. To me, this is the single most important thing that I can share with you all today. It's that we have this person we want to be, and there's a fear of getting there from who we are right now. And the only way, I think, to really get there is to acknowledge and embrace that fear by speaking the language of the person we seek to become. And so I'd encourage you, focus on finding one person in every single room you walk into. It will carry you so much further. When you're at an event like this, don't try and get a stack of business cards from every single person you can meet. If you can leave here with one real, authentic friendship, I guarantee you it will take you so much further than if you walked in and tried to meet every single person in the room. But if any of you want to follow up with me, I'm here to be of service. I hope that I can present uh, value to you all continuing forward. This is my email. It's adam at ipromise.org. Please, please reach out to me. Whether it's about getting involved in Pencils of Promise and helping to build an upcoming school, whether it is about uh, me supporting your business in any way that I can, please contact me. Uh, I'd love to be of help. And the last thing that I'll share with you all is this simple idea. Uh, it's a phrase by Alan Johnson Sirleaf, uh, who is the first female president of the African continent. Things are going to be scary ahead. Things are going to be challenging. But I hope these ideas have resonated with you all. I hope you can recognize your tremendous capacity to go from ordinary to extraordinary. And then ultimately, along the way, if your dreams do not scare you, then they are not big enough. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah! Look at this.